will fade. Hello, Bobo. How you doing, man? Pretty good. What's going on, Cliff? All sorts of stuff as usual. I had a pretty eventful weekend. We can get into that a little bit in the members uh, section here because we have a great guest. We don't take too long for it. But remember those uh, fake stompers I mentioned to you last time? Yeah, yeah. I dug a little bit deeper. Uh, last Friday, I went and interviewed uh, two gentlemen. Um, one of the gentlemen was um, 101 years old. The other gentleman was only 94 years old. I think he was 94. Hmm. Yeah, so it's like 200 years of dudes in the room, you know, plus me. And uh, um, it was interesting. I didn't get a lot of answers uh, of, of what I was looking for, but I got some clarification about a couple of things. And, uh, but I guess the most important thing about all that stuff is um, looking back into the interview with the guy who gave me the stompers, because uh, part of the deal with me getting the stompers was he's going to tell me when he used them to the best of his recollection and stuff. I tracked it down. Sure enough, I am 99% sure those are the same stompers that made the footprints that Barbara Wasson cast in 1974, I believe, December 1974. If you have a copy of Barbara Wasson's book, Sasquatch Apparitions, uh, Barbara was one of the early uh, researchers in the 1970s. She's one of the only female researchers at the time, um, a pioneer really in a lot of ways, She's using data, crunching numbers, uh, working in the, in the field with a bunch of other people and uh, collaborating with them. She's part of John Green's crew back in the early days. Is a fantastic Bigfooter. Yeah, she starts her book, Sasquatch Apparitions, telling the story of uh, um, these tracks and I'll be darned if the guy who gave me those stompers, who I got the stompers from, he said, the first time I used them, it was down in Southern Oregon at this one location. And sure enough, that's where she's talking about. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, you know, it's unfortunate. But at the same time, now we know. Yeah, she'd want to know the truth. Yeah, she would want to know the truth, I think. You know, she definitely would want to know the truth. But nowadays, you know, I have the original cast. There's been, never been a copy made of it, by the way. Um, I, ha I own the original cast because the NABC owns the entire Barbara Wasson collection, um, of course, for our archives. But um, I, I got out the cast, I got out the stompers, and not only does the story match, but the actual prints match as well. So that's unfortunate in one way and good in another way. But you know what? Makes me wonder all these eighteen inch footprints and stuff like that. Um, this because this is eighteen inches. I think I just think that's too big, man. I think that the males have. I think the big males have feet that are fifteen or sixteen inches long. I think those real, real big ones. I want to take a real close look at a lot of these things. I bet some of them aren't real, and some are, of course, slippage as well. Because I, I always say we have we have a footprint of an individual who has uh, fourteen inch feet that left an eighteen and a half inch footprint. But, see, but speaking of tracks, I got a. Like something good. I think you're going to like it. You might even want to put it in your museum in some form. Um, I got a message today from Eric of the Bigfoot Museum in Willow Creek. And he, uh, after that, we had that meeting with the McCoys, uh, with Dave McCoy, and he called his brothers and cousins and all that. So McCoy's son, they, they listened to the podcast and they were stoked. They're like, oh, man, we're so glad to hear our father getting the respect he deserves, you know, and recognition. And they, they lit a fire and they're looking gung ho for everything. And they found a, Original from the first time he cast tracks at Trackway, uh, Eric got a copy of a three three minutes of film of them casting it. It's a little washed out with you know too light, I guess, but uh, it's pretty good. He said it's decent enough, and I thought, man, Cliff could put that on a little loop for uh, some of his Bluff Creek display or something. Oh yeah, yeah. If I can uh, get a hold of it, I can digitize it and give them back the original, so they still own it. Just the permission to use it in the sh shop. It'd be fantastic. Yeah, because we have we have those we own those pictures from High and Palm, and uh, Syl McCoy was directly involved in that stuff. Right. But, you know, I am planning on coming down. I'm going to come down this summer and hang out. Maybe you can come out with me or something, Bo. It's been a while since we've been in the woods together. But uh, I do want to see how Bluff Creek uh, fared during all that fire and stuff. And I definitely plan on dropping by the museum and talking to Eric. I had a great conversation with him when he called and, you know, he's not running the Willow Creek Museum, but he's deeply involved in it. And I'm clearly running this museum. So we have a lot to talk about and some collaboration might be afoot. No pun intended. Yeah. Yeah. It, he's, I'm glad he's there, man, because he's got plans for it. So that's great. We can talk about this during the member section because there's always stuff to talk about in the member section. Plus, we always take questions every single week from our members. We'll get to that later. But I don't want to keep our guest on the line too much longer because I'm excited about this one. And, um, and, some people out there might be puzzling about that because we have a paranormal guest on and Cliff's excited about it. Well, you'll, you'll see why here. I think this is going to be great. Yeah, he's cool. Dave, I, I was on his show a couple of times. He's a good dude. 
And of course, if you if you are interested in hearing what Bob and I talk about in the member section, we're not we're not hiding it from you. But you know, if you're interested in becoming a member, uh, there's a link in the show notes, um, and we get an extra episode every Thursday, so you get pretty much twice the Cliff and Bobo. All right, well, let's jump into our guest tonight, and then I'm very, very pleased to have our friend on. Uh, Dave Schrader is our guest tonight. He's a ghost dude. That's how I know him, Um, because, you know, I don't watch a lot of TV and stuff in general, but I do know Dave from doing various gigs around town and whatnot. Um, He's been on a couple panels with me, and just uh, I always have a great time speaking with him. Um, He's been on a number of television shows, like The Holzer Files, The Ghosts of Devil's Perch, which are two of the most recent ones, but I think he's been on countless ones, or at least I've never counted them, that's for sure. But uh, right now... Now, I think uh, he has a very popular podcast called Paranormal 60. And so, Dave, Dave Schrader, welcome to Bigfoot and Beyond. I'm so glad you can join us. Well, thank you both for having me on. I appreciate this. I've, I, you know, I've had Bobo on my show when I used to be on Darkness Radio, and uh, he was so popular that I think we ended up having him back the next night to continue our conversation and had a great time. So, and Cliff, you and I always just seem to miss each other when availability would open up, but I'm glad I get a chance to visit with you now. And this is fantastic. Thanks for having me in. Well, you know, it's hard to have just one, one helping of Bobo. You always want to have seconds when you have that dish, you know? Oh, no doubt. <laughs> Plenty to go around. <laughs> nice. And, and, you know, I don't do a lot of podcasts nowadays because um, I, I work on one, you know, and it's like, you know, I, I bet a maid's house is dirty, for example, you know, um, so I don't do a lot of podcasts in my off time, but I'd be happy to do yours anytime. You just give me a holler. Let me know. So, oh, you know it. We'd love to have you come on and chat and uh, catch up our audience on all things cryptid as well. That's such a huge, huge following that it's strange to me, you know, as, as a guy who's been in the paranormal field actively as a radio show host for 18 years first with darkness radio i was a fill-in host on coast to coast for five years and then i've been doing my uh, new podcast the paranormal 60 for the last three years it's always amazing to me that i could come out with some of the most unbelievably amazing stories of reincarnation or demonic possession or hauntings that are making the amityville look like kitty play but then I do an episode on Bigfoot and I get multiples of downloads than I would get on any other episode. And it's great to see that that interest and fascination continues, but it's kind of confounding. And I'd actually love to pick both of your brains. There's so much going on in the world and the concept that, you know, alien disclosures kind of out there now, there's ghost shows everywhere, but there's always just one, maybe two Bigfoot style shows going on. Why do you think there's so much excitement that continues in the field of cryptozoology? Because it's real. Yeah, they're real animals. It's as simple as that. I mean, um, b- people wonder when the like people who don't think Sasquatch is real wonder when the whole thing's going to go away. And it's like that's like asking, well, gosh, you know, when when is this whole elk thing going to go away? You know, when is this whole black bear thing going to go away? I'm, I'm tired of it. I mean, aren't, aren't people going to be finished talking about it? It's like no, there's always going to be hunters. You know, they're they're always going to there's going to be outdoors people, and there are always going to be Sasquatches around because they're just here. You know, it, it is persistent because of the reality of the species. I like it. And I love the fact that people um, have this ongoing fascination when, and again, being a guy on the outside and having watched your shows and the other shows that have come out regarding uh, cryptids and Bigfoot in specific, it's, it's always fascinating to me that there's such fleeting amounts of what would be considered really amazing evidence that I've had a chance to see. But yet that's enough to just keep people really intrigued by the concept that there might be this whether it's a ghostly creature, an interdimensional being, or just a zoological creature we have not yet identified, it's it's fun to watch people really glom onto this and have such a deep love and respect and fondness for that specific creature. Yeah, I think it might have something to do with that. We see a little bit of ourselves in them, you know, because they're shaped like us, for example, you know, like they, they had the general morphology of a human being, kind of, sort of, um, even though they're very, very different from us, obviously, in, in pretty much every aspect. But um, they are kind of like us. And I think we kind of see that and glom onto it in the same sort of way that back in the day, you know, like 1960s, 1970s, um, people got a kick out of like watching, a, seeing a chimpanzee in a suit or something like that. Right. You know, <laughs> I, I think that there's something akin to that. I'm not sure what that word would be, but I think there's something akin to that. It's just unfortunate. I always find it unfortunate um, how uh, the depiction that the media gives the subject and also the researchers. 
You know, the um, the researchers are often uh, depicted very, very poorly, like gullible, tinfoil hat wearing weirdos. And mind you, some of us are, but um, but the the subject itself um, deserves such a higher level of respect than what I feel it gets on television and the internet and whatever else. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, the subject is here. It is real. And the animals are real, just perfectly normal animals out in the woods. And as long as they're walking around, the, the, the mystery of the subject will also be walking around at least until a uh, discovery day, whenever that is. So just like tenacious D saying, which is, you know, that mother effer is real, 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 real Sasquatch is real. There you go. Yeah, yeah I think you, you'd, you'd have to finish that. I'm not sure everybody would know that they were they actually said that. You don't know the Sasquatch song by Tenacious D? I do not. You don't? Sasquatch, your love is real. It's great. It's an epic ballad, and it will have some really hard rocking parts as well. It, it's really a, a, the quintessence of prog rock in some ways. See, nobody's writing good ghost story songs anymore. Yeah, you know what? Why not? Because there's a there's a there's a whole lot of Sasquatch songs. So what's up with that? We're we're the artists in the ghost world. How come they're not doing that? I don't. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, it, there might be. They're just not as vocal about it, and it's just a topic that you don't hear coming. But I like one of my fa- favorite all time songs uh, of any genre is Charlie Daniels Band, The Legend of Wooly Swamp, and uh, the ghostly stories and just the concept of being deep out in the woods and not knowing your surroundings and, and just how dangerous it could be and how dangerous it is for the three brothers that go and seek of the, the fortune that uh, is told to, to be out there. But I just love that ghost story. That's always been one of my favorites. And uh, I, I love the fact that it was all in a song format. But of course, Charlie Daniels also did the double down in Georgia. So there, there seems to be a lot of uh, spiritual or, you know, uh, songs along in his uh, repertoire in his songbook, perhaps. Could it be? And I, I don't know. I'm, I, I don't, I'm, I'm assuming a fair number of ghost people listen to this. Maybe they don't. They've had enough of me. I don't know. But um, perhaps could it be that uh, ghost people don't sing very well? You know, I'm not going to even put that out there because, uh, <laughs> listen, I'm a huge fan of Bruce Springsteen and he's got a bunch of songs about ghosts and he even has a song called The Jersey Devil. So I'm going to give him the credit where credit is due. At least I know one guy's still putting out some songs with uh, paranormal slants and themes to them. Maybe he absorbed everybody else's talent. Yeah, that would be the only excuse that I can understand. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just messing with the ghost community. So, because you know, I, I'm not anti ghost. I get a lot of that in the shop or whatever. Or if I'm out on a gig at, a, at, a, at one of these speaking deals, people come up to me and says, I know you're not a paranormal guy. And I know this and that, blah, blah. So, well, you don't know much because, you know, I told you on stage, remember when we did the Oregon Bigfoot conference last year, I told you my ghost story in front of everybody. You know, like I do think paranormal stuff happens. I just don't know what that stuff is. And I, under no circumstances, do I think Sasquatches are in any way paranormal. You know, but that's just a, a, a when you when you look at the the weird fields that you know you and I and everybody else looks into. If you want to put that under the umbrella of unknown or supernatural or paranormal, I said, eh, okay. But um, Sasquatch is a very very small slice of that pie, and um, that's a very very uh, boring slice of that pie in some ways because there isn't, in my opinion, anything paranormal about it. Um, but I. I I'm into all other weird things. How do you think I got into Bigfoot in the first place is my thought, you know, like clearly you're, you're not like a perfectly normal person who just happens to be interested in Sasquatches. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Bobo, if, you, if you're going to, if you're going to argue now that you're a perfectly normal person, um, I, I don't even know what to say to you. I am. He is one of the most normal people he knows. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually, I've hung out at your house for a week or so at a time up in Humboldt and between, you know, you and Jesse legend and heavy metal Pat and rubber arm Joe and all your other weird Muppet friends that come by. Um, you know, <laughs> I guess you are pretty normal. Exactly. But didn't you tell me once that I'm, I'm the most normal person, you know, you were the most normal person that I introduced to my parents as a friend. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. You're the token normal friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Of course I am. You had a job back then. <laughs> I failed you. I failed you. Well, anyway, Dave, Dave. So um, I've got a couple questions for you. Now, again, I, I, I don't watch much TV. Maybe this is already out there or something like that. But specifically, um, The Holzer Files, right? Um, you, that was one of the shows you're on. And apparently, I, I was reading a little bit about it in preparation for the interview here. And um, what I get is that there was a historic ghost person or paranormal person called Dr. Hans Holzer. And that, that show explored his files. Is that is that the correct like slant of the show there, the synopsis? 
Yeah, Dr. Hans Holzer uh, had been around. You know, he's a very preeminent paranormal investigator. They they call him one of America's first ghost hunters. Uh, he had a, a TV series known as Ghost Hunters long before the Ghost Hunters TV series came out. He was on network news all the time. He uh, put the Whaley House in San Diego on the map while investigating it with his friend Regis Philbin, who captured weird experiences on film. The Regis? Yeah, if you look online, as a matter of fact, they did that Celebrity Ghost Stories or My Ghost Stories a few years ago, where they would take some of these celebrities back to the locations that, uh, you know, that upset them, that they had these encounters with. And Regis talked very openly about his, uh, his paranormal encounters at the Whaley House. Well, that's the weirdest thing I've heard all day. Yeah. Good. We've just begun. <laughs> Dr. Holzer... Uh, he really, you know, he wrote over, I think it was 185 books on just about every angle of the strange and supernatural from witchcraft to UFOs to um, miracle priests to ghosts and, and hauntings and famous haunted locations. And like him, I have such a love and fascination of history that it was just so when they opened the door to me to let me in to investigate his files, I jumped on it because when they first when they first reached out, they're like, hey, Dave, you know, hey, we're aware of you. We're interested in having you uh, lead on a ghost show. And I'm like, oh, I think I'm good. Thanks. And they were like, well, no, this is TV. And I'm like, yeah, I think I'm good. That's why I'm saying no. Don't you understand? <laughs> <laughs> trying to be polite, right? But I'm like, I, there's enough ghost shows. And uh, I don't want to just be part of a cookie cutter cast. And they're like, no, no, no. This is totally different. And I said, how is it different? Well, it's just going to be three of you. And I said, I think that show is called Ghost Adventures. And he goes, no, no, no. One of you is going to be a medium and a psychic. And I said, oh, so it's kind of like Dead Files. No, no, no. It's I, I, I can't tell you until you agree that you want to be a part of this. And I'm like, well, we're at an impasse then because I'm not going to be a part of something I don't know more about. So I signed some thick phone book style uh, NDA. And as soon as I signed it, they said, we're reopening the case files of Dr. Hans Holzer. And that's all they got out of their mouths. And I'm like, I'm in. Count me in. This will be amazing. So I was willing to do that. They had all the original video, photographs, audio recordings, uh, handwritten notes, everything he had done over his like 45, 50 year span of investigating the supernatural. And I was, man, I grew up reading Hans Holzer's books. So to get a chance to to follow in his footsteps. And another interesting tie I had to Dr. Holzer was our, our radio show. We were the last radio show that he did before he, he uh, sadly passed away. Yeah. Cause he lived until I, I think I remember it, 2009 or something like that. So pretty yeah, it was recently. Around 2008, 2009 uh, that he passed away. And um, you know, I, I became friends with his daughter, Alexandra, and she was a part of this program. So it really, it was a great opportunity. I'm glad we got to do it for two seasons. I, I, in all their haste to get the show on the air, I think they misnamed it. I, you know, Holzer Files is really cool if you are a trident and true paranormal fan and know who Dr. Hans Holzer was. But, you know, he had passed away in 2008, 2009. He wasn't on any of the big paranormal TV series. Uh, of our time here since, you know, the relaunch in about 2001 with all of the different glut of paranormal style shows that came out. So he wasn't as familiar. And I, I kept telling him, could we, let's name the show Holzer's Ghost Files. I think if the audience knows what, you know, what the files are that we're investigating, otherwise it sounds like a seventies detective show. And, uh, they didn't change the name. We, we built a, you know, a nice gathering, but just not enough to keep us on for a third season. It's hard to find a producer who would listen, you know, and think that, oh, the host that's been doing this for 30 years may know a little bit more about the subject than I do because I've been researching this for six months. Yeah. No, I've, I've, I've learned that uh, in, in the world of TV, everybody is smarter than you. So I just, you know, nod and smile and do my job the best to my abilities. And that's, that's all I did. They rolled Cindy Kaza, the medium and I that were on the Holzer Files over to another program called uh, The Ghosts Of, and we were brought out to Butte, Montana to investigate, and we stayed there for a little over 90 days, uh, just living and breathing and sweating in that same town with the people, and it was it was a great experience, but holy cow, what a bunch of weird paranormal things are going on in that town, and there's everything from UFO sightings to cryptid sightings to ghosts and what they believe are demons, so that was a, another head trip to be a part of a program like that. 
Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. When so much um, variety of weird stuff happens around a location in particular, do you think it has more to do with the people or the location itself? Like, like uh, there's people like Bobo, for example, I believe, and I don't want to put words in his mouth. You can refute this if you choose, Bobes. But um, like he's very strong. He's a strong advocate of the vortex kind of idea, you know, or the skinwalker skinwalker ranch thing out in Utah, or any of these number of things. You think it's a location? deal or is it a people deal i think it's a mixture of both i i think that like in the case of butte montana here you've got this gorgeous land and it drew all these people because of the minerals that were in the earth the silver the gold and the copper which is really what was so big there and you know they built this it was the wild west baby there were you know shootouts and you had such a it was a mining town that worked 24 7 so did the brothels there were blocks of of whorehouses that ran 24 hours a day and there were levels to the whorehouses that you could visit depending on how much money you made so there you know literally there was elite on the top floor all the way down to guys that were making pennies um, there was something for everybody and it was a town, you know, in violence steeped in, in shootouts and fisticuffs and, you know, sex and violence and, and money and greed. And I think that that taints the ground after a while, that, that kind of anxiety, that kind of stress can have an impact and an effect on an area. And I don't know if people are drawn to a specific place because of the energy that's there or do we create this rift, this vortex, because of the way we treat a location, its history, and the people that walked that place before we were there? Maybe one begets the other. It's hard to say because there are some places that are extremely haunted that we have no, – nobody died here. We don't know why this is so active, you know? Uh, and, and not only that, but they're seeing UFOs in the sky. And people in the neighborhood have had Bigfoot encounters. And – it's just, to me, it's astonishing because I can't figure out what is it about this. It, it ends up like an episode of Stranger Things. It's just like Bobo loves these vortex, the, these portal spots that just seem to be a hotbed of activity of many different styles. Interesting. Yeah. You, uh, one thing I wonder about, though, is why isn't there, I mean, because Native Americans live here tens of thousands of years it's like, why aren't more of their ghosts seen? I mean, I know they're seen sometimes, but it seems like they should be seen a lot more. That's a great question. And again, nobody has the one answer. I, I often wonder, though, if time is not linear, if it is like the string theory, and it's a big ball of timey-wimey, wibbly-wobbly stuff, right? And it's, could it be that the timeline of 1800 to 1921 happens to being, you know, laying over the timeline of 2000 to 2030? And as time and space continue to change and undulate, will, will the next layer of time lay upon uh, Native American spirits or ancient Rome? Will we see more of that taking place? Um, it also may have to do with the belief systems of, of the locations. You know, the native people and indigenous tribes were so respectful of their dead and did everything they could to put these, these people and beings and spirits to rest that I think that um, there's not that same dissension. And even, even the brutal murders that took place and, and disenfranchising these, these tribes people, which is heartbreaking to talk about. I think that they were on a different level of evolution in a mindset that, that although the death was not something that they would have wanted or chosen, I think they felt that in the battle that they did to try to save their people, save their culture, they move on because it was a heroic deed. Um, so I think there's some elements of that. I also think it also, you know, we see these cyclical moments when paranormal seems to be in resurgence. And there was that 1800s to early 1900s, famine, disease, uh, pestilence, all of these horrible things that were taking place. And people were constantly calling out to the spirit realm and spiritualists. Did we rupture something in doing that, that that's why we see that time era and we don't see the time era of other places. 
Um, and maybe the places that do say the Native American uh, spirits are places like Skinwalker Ranch or, or you know, deep in the wilderness where we don't walk still. And that may be where the, the indigenous spirits and tribes people still gather. No, that, that brings an interesting th- question to my mind, at least. At least I think it's interesting. Um, researchers, at least in Bigfoot, and I'm, I'm, I don't know if this is true in ghosts or not, uh, researchers are honestly seem to be kind of few and far between. Most of the people in the Bigfoot world um, are, tend to be like fans of the subject, aficionados, you know, but almost nobody's really taking notes, like uh, using Excel sheets and, and you know, t- that kind of stuff, looking for patterns and almost nobody, really, very, very few people. Um, are there people doing that in the ghost field or are they doing the equivalent of going out and banging on trees and listening for something and maybe bringing a recording home you know which is i guess like i don't know i've i've seen a, like a few minutes of occasional ghost shows like i guess yelling at a wall or something and saying are you there <laughs> i don't i don't know I, I i know very little about the ghost world you know i i, know, I mean i'm going to be very honest i know almost nothing about all this so this is all new to me we're not that different cliff we go into dark areas by ourselves and we do our own versions of the whoop hello is there anyone here? Knock on the wall if you can hear me. And you bang the walls, hoping they're going to bang back. So our shows are not that different <laughs> in that concept of hoping, finding a way to c- connect with something and uh, and get those answers. But there are a lot of different organizations that have been working, the Rhine Institute. Uh, UCLA used to have a huge parapsychological department. Uh, Dr. Barry Taff worked there. Thelma, oh gosh, right? her last name is, is escaping me. But there have been a lot of different places and still some that continue to investigate these these type of phenomenon to understand it or try to. And they take the time to corroborate evidence and, and what they find, you know, what are we able to tell my friend, Bill Chapel, who is the engineer, he's created so many amazing, fun, interesting tools for the paranormal trade and investigating ghosts. He will tell you, he's not a, necessarily a believer in ghosts. He can't tell you what's activating these pieces of equipment, but he'll take our theories and build equipment around it as an actual electrical engineer to see can these things be influenced by an outside source? And he had a, a, a tool called the paranormal puck, and it was not real flashy. It wasn't real pretty. You plugged it into your laptop, you ran the software, but it would calibrate and tell you what the temperature is, what the dew point average was, what the uh, you know geomagnetic principles of the area you were in. It gave you all of this background stuff that nobody really cared about because everybody just wants to see a ghost. And he had tons of data, but nobody would bother to look at the data in correlation with what was taking place. It became more of a thrill in an entertainment industry than it did a scientific principle. And I I, I know I'm going to take heat for saying that because there are teams out there that claim they're scientific, but like you, where are their, their reports? Where is their scientific work and who have they peer reviewed with and you know what's going on? That just doesn't exist anymore. Well, so amongst the data gatherers, um, so it sounds like there are some, which is which is good to hear, of course, you know. Um, uh, amongst the data gatherers, has there ever been a study already publishing, or or what's the the gist of um, the apparitions or whatever, for lack of a better term, that are observed? Are there are there um, a predominance of a certain time period, kind of going back to what we were talking about before, like our our, our most ghosts, you know, uh, Victorian, for example, Victorian era, eighteen hundreds to the early nineteen hundreds. It's like you know, usually in that roundhouse of about maybe eighteen seventies to nineteen twenty one, depending on the type of garb, the things that they do or say or have been witnessed doing. But being a fan of science as well, I'm not necessarily sure that we're seeing a dead person in the way that you think we are. Yeah, well, which is what I wanted to ask you next. Like, is that what we're dealing with? Because I, 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 I'm friends with a fair number of ghost folks, and it seems the jury is out. Like that, they're not necessarily dead people that people are encountering. So, what's going on? You think? I think some of it is time slip phenomena. I think the concept that there are just points where you can, you know, you're sharing a location, you're sharing a place that has always existed and always will exist. It's been in many different forms, but the spot you're sitting on has always existed and always will well after you're gone and well before you were here. And every, every person that treads that area is like a page in a book. 
And from time to time, I think those pages align and you can kind of see the text through one page into another. And, you know, like the movie, the others with Nicole Kidman, where she's hearing these ghostly sounds and voices and she's being tormented and spoiler alert on a 20 year old movie. It turns out that they're the dead people and the voices she's hearing are people from the future. Uh, that are living in that house. And I really do think that there are elements of that that have occurred. Um, You know, Ghost Hunters did a TV episode when they went to, I think it was Mount Washington uh, and uh, Hotel, and they were engaging with the spirit. And they, you know, Princess, can you hear us? Can you? Yes, I can hear you. This is my room. Where are you? What kind of game are you playing? And she was going to get security. So that tells me in her consciousness she must have been in her room hearing these voices. When I was at, at Waverly Hills Sanatorium in Kentucky, it was a tuberculosis clinic. Tens of thousands of people reportedly died. And then it was a geriatric home and hospital. And nurses and doctors talked about it being haunted at its time. And when we were there investigating, I was with two other fellow investigators. We rounded the corner and a nurse walked around, stopped and looked at us. Her eyes got huge. She turned and ran the other direction. It's an old dilapidated building at that point. There aren't nurses working there. What did we just witness? And to her, did she tell somebody in her time era, I just saw three ghosts in the hall. I just saw three men that were there. They came out of nowhere. And, you know, that's what's so fascinating to me about this. I can't give you one specific answer to what this phenomena is how it happens, because I think there's many different layers to hauntings. And that's what keeps me so fascinated and intrigued by this. Is that the Washington Hotel, the Washington Hotel in New New Hampshire, Vermont up there? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Mount Washington. We were there and Moneymaker conjured up a ghost. Yeah, we filmed a Finding Bigfoot episode there. That's where we stayed, and we were out in the woods doing stuff or whatever. But um, on our night off or whatever, um, I wasn't involved in all that because Melissa was on the crew, and I was hanging out with her. But um, but uh, everybody else went ghost hunting that night, and, and weird stuff happened. Well, our, our sound person or tech, uh, she saw she saw it, and uh, it was up in the ceiling area, like swirling around, and she didn't even know that that's where the workers would see it. It was like in this one landing kind of like vestibule area or whatever and uh, on the staircases and, and they said oh yeah that's, that's a really common place to see it but yeah moneymaker had his himalayan like a tibetan tibetan bowl. like bowl singing bowl that he brought with him from tibet or from uh from uh, uh nepal rather he got one of those when we were out there doing yeti stuff and he brought it and he goes he's like doing the, the thing on it and having fun with it <laughs> right and and the resonance of the bowl Look, Native American and indigenous tribes people will talk about music and these things that will help them connect to the spiritual realm and to nature. Um, I know places that use singing bowls to try to communicate with alien life forms. I know uh, people that use them in the spiritual realm to try to communicate with uh, angry spirits and try to bring some harmony. So it's interesting how there are commonalities and threads throughout all of the different levels of what's considered supernatural or paranormal. And it is funny to me that Bigfoot still falls under that umbrella for many people, right? The cryptids are still in that realm of the supernatural. Um, and, and, you know, just like they're cryptozoological until we find one and now it becomes zoological and it will no longer be supernatural. It'll be just part of our natural world. But it's, it's interesting to me that there are these different layers of the tapestry that still do seem to connect things like Bigfoot sightings, alien or UFO sightings, and haunted hotspots. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. And when, you, when you say haunted, uh, do you guys make a delineation between uh, older like entities that are like spirits or demons or whatever you want to call them versus just human souls, like in a different like time warp kind of thing. Yeah. That's what I was mentioning is there's all of these different layers to what a haunting could be. And I think you're short sighted. If you just want to pigeonhole ghosts are this, you know, uh, aliens are this, I, I think there's many different possibilities to what these beings are. And if we limit ourselves, it might limit our ability to look at them more scientifically, to find a way to communicate, find ways to, to, 
kind of circumvent the normalcy of communication of things that we'd say, this, this can't be real. This can't exist. So let's put our mindset in a different way. If we examine it differently, can we find something that will actually make sense and start to help us bridge that chasm and understand more about the spiritual realm? I think there's times that they knew more 200 years ago about ghosts and the spiritual realm than we understand about it now. Same with creatures, right? And, you know, the reverence people had for the the mountain gorillas, but everybody thought that it was a, a, a lie. It wasn't until I think it's only been like 170 years, 180 years since gorillas were officially found. It's like 1852 or something like that. And, uh, and mountain gorillas, I believe, were 1902. I probably am a year or two off on one of those, but yeah. Right. And isn't that absurd to think that that far along in our history, which is just a drop of water in the microchasm of, of the universal ocean that we're a part of, that's such a small percentage that we can say we've only known about this creature legitimately for the last couple hundred years. Something we take for granted. Gorillas have always been around. Yeah. I, I t- you know, one of the things that makes me uh, um, really lament our situation um, in, in the, hu- the human situation in some ways is that um, most people don't realize that science is in its infancy at this moment in its infancy, Be, uh, 130 years ago about, we didn't know about germs, for God's sake, you know? Like, we uh, have barely begun our journey into the unknown. You know, most of our human history has been a, a wash in superstition and mythology, essentially. And uh, the and science wasn't even a thing, you know, until probably, I don't know, 1830 or something like that, 1850. Before that, they were called naturalists. And then science wasn't even a thing. And we think we're all advanced because we have, you know, iPhones in our pocket. No, no, we're, we're, we're infants. And before that, it was witches and shaman. And it was magic. These things that we were taking, these, these plant extracts that they would crush up and then give to you for, for headache powder. And that's what we now call aspirin, right? It's so funny that science is not that far along. Even in, this baffles my mind. We still cannot figure out where consciousness exists in a human being. We can't even define what consciousness is. And death is constantly changing. What we believed even 10 years ago about death is radically different now. And we're realizing that there may be consciousness in a physical body once the heart stops for up to four hours. What do you think about this idea that I've seen um, slowly start spreading, I think, amongst the paranormal world? Um, and I think that some Bigfooters fall into this as well. And I, I don't think it fits Sasquatch stuff at all, of course. But you know me, I'm pretty practical about this whole animal thing. But it, but the other paranormal stuff, I think the jury's out. I don't know anything about it. Um, I'm coming from a place of ignorance, and I'm going to enjoy that ignorance. You know, ignorance is bliss. I'm going to be pretty happy about this for the moment because I don't know much. Um, this idea of uh, the, like the grand unification theory of the paranormal, where some people, instead of ghosts and demons and this and that's and whatevers, they just refer to it as the phenomenon. What do you think about that? Or, or is that boiling it down too much and maybe disrespecting certain aspects of these other phenomena? Well, I can see that element of it, but I also see the fact that if we just accept it as one thing, that it, it becomes less ominous. Because look, look, I can sit here and talk to you about ghosts and demons because I've encountered things that I would put into those categories. To me, the concept of this hairy hominid bipedal creature that could be nine to 14 feet tall, depending on who you speak to, that's there one second, gone the next, that would be an easy roll of the eyes and uh, snicker, right? About, God, you guys actually believe this thing exists? But then I'm two seconds later talking to you about ghosts and demons, which to somebody else sounds ridiculous. So if we normalize it and take away the stigma of, well, this is weird. That's not is, is the Fay folk. Is that any less weird than Bigfoot? I don't think so because it's gone back in culture. Like the indigenous tribes have talked about Bigfoot and have seen them as, you know, a fellow race of indigenous people to a creature, to something almost godlike in some instances that aliens kind of fit that same realm. Ghosts fit that same realm. So if we come together on one common ground 
and say, this is phenomenon. And this may all be tied together. It may be different, but at least we, we take the time to look at it because if you take out part of science, you take out, you know, we're examining blood, but we don't want to look at platelets because platelets aren't our, our thing. We're all about, you know, white blood cells. Well, then you're missing a big part of the full, you know, spectrum of the picture. So I think that by having this kind of universal approach to look at this, I think that could be a healthier way for us all to examine it, take it a little bit more seriously. And, you know, the pegs will fall out for the weak links, for the things that don't make any sense. There's nothing weird about the Faye folk, though. Well, James Bobo Faye, there's something pretty weird about that one. <laughs> right, but here's the whole thing. I remember having this discussion with Rosemary Ellen Guiley. She was the, the queen of the nighttime world, another a, a prolific author we lost a few years ago, and speaker and teacher. And she uh, she kind of put me in my place one day because I was laughing about the fact she had a book about fairies coming out. And I'm like, oh, my God, seriously. And she's like, why is that so stupid and funny to you? And I'm like, they're fairies. That's Disney stuff. And she goes, well, Dave, do you realize how many Disney movies have creatures and ghosts in them? Or do you scoff at that because that's been represented in, in your shows? And I'm like, well, no, but that's different. How is that different? These stories predate ghost stories in some instances. They will look at the fae and these elemental beings as something that predate even Christianity, the jinn, and many things that are referred to and referenced in the Bible that predate known man in history. It's it's really kind of compelling. And she gave me another way to look at it. She said, you'll look at Bigfoot and say, yeah, that, that could be real. You'll look at ghosts and say, oh, sure, and aliens, of course. But the fae? No, that can't be possible. She said, that's being ridiculous. There is something to that. People have this, you know, love and compassion and respect for it in other countries. And, and then I started reading news stories in the 2000s, not, not meaning that there's been over 2000 news stories, but I mean, since the 2000s began, I have found news stories where multiple countries and, and cultures have diverted major roadways to avoid troll houses or, or fairy rings or fairy mounds or giant mounds because they don't want to disturb that culture, that being or set of beings. So there must be something to it that makes it much more real than we would give it credit to. So I, I've, you know, I've learned to be open to all of it. I don't scoff at anything anymore, no matter how ludicrous it may sound to me, because just because it hasn't been my experience doesn't mean that it isn't real. You know, there is a parallel of that in the Sasquatch world, um, even the flesh and blood Sasquatch world, you know, where I, I tend to dwell. Um, and it's that uh, this idea of relic hominoids, you know, um, hairy hominoids worldwide, because almost certainly um, like the Orang Pendek, for example, is not the Sasquatch. It's a different species. But we don't know that jury's out about the the Yeren or the Yowie or, or even the Alma, although the Alma has so many different characteristics and, and there is actually footprint evidence of the Alma and it doesn't seem to be a Sasquatch. But still, um, and, and the discovery of any of those would benefit the all of the others um, in, in that people would be more open to their possibility. Um, so perhaps there's a that's a parallel of what you're actually describing, but in the um, you know the unknown mystery ape world, right? And it's all fascinating and and interesting that these cultures exist like this. And I'll tell you what, there are times where you can tell me your story and your experience. I don't have to believe it. And sometimes what I find more fascinating than anything is why you believe in these things. So that's part of the human element is learning and exchanging of ideas and concepts and seeing what might make sense to you once you've heard somebody else's theology or belief system on it. Now, now speaking of believing, I, um, I know you're very open to all sorts of things, but uh, do you believe Sasquatches are real, right? In some sort of way, right? Now, is that based on an experience or is that because of the evidence or is that you've heard so many stories or what's going on there? Well, listen, I like you guys, I grew up in the era of In Search Of, and I saw that footage when they started sharing it uh, of, of the Patterson-Gimlin film. Uh, I was also born in 1967, the same year. So that had a fascination for me, right, that that, that footage came out. So I, I always thought that was cool, but I didn't start taking notice of that until you know mid-70s when it was on TV all the time. And when I would go down to visit my grandparents in 74, 75 to Foley, Alabama, uh, my grandparents owned 40 acres of property. 
and only about 10 acres was livable. The rest was just wildness, right? And, and, um, there were snakes and water moccasin snakes and alligators in the back cause they had ponds and, and water streams back there. So it was, it was not a safe place to be as a kid, but we used to go play in that area all the time. And, uh, one time my cousin and I were down by the pond, probably about nine, 10 o'clock in the morning fishing. And we just heard something big tromping around out there. And we kept looking at each other kind of like, well, you're here. I guess I'm okay. Right. It's that safety in numbers. But it was big, whatever it was, and we could hear it stomping around. And then finally, at the back of the pond, there were these tall shrubs and bushes that may be eight, nine feet tall. And I see this hand come up over the top of the bush, and it pushes the bush down. And now I can see from about the tip of the nose up of this being that I believe was a Sasquatch. But it had a darker inset face. It had this kind of blackish gray mane and the hair came up over its fingers like Chewbacca's hair, right? It wasn't just like you would think of a gorilla. It was like long drapey hair. And my cousin and I just literally, my brain broke. We just stared at this thing and then looked at each other and turned back around and looked at this thing staring at us. And then we scooby-dooed it up the hill and half of the thing we're laughing about is we're going to get up there and find out it's one of our idiot dads in a gorilla mask trying to freak us out. We get up to the house. Our dads are there. Our cousins are there. Our grandpas are there. Our uncles are there. Everybody's accounted for. And we were so spun out by it that they all grabbed their rifles and went out into the woods looking. And at that time, nobody was thinking, go to the area where it stood and look at the ground. Are there footprints? I'm sure that there was regret because my uncle grew to love Bigfoot stories. And and I'm sure he always kind of kicked himself for never having gone to look at that space. But that was the perfect environment for something like this to live because 10 acres uh, is livable. That leaves you, you know, 30 acres of woodland area that nobody goes into really because of all of the other inherent dangers that are out there. So it's kind of a safety zone and safety buffer for whatever might be existing. And my grandparents saw UFO activity over their property. Um, So again, here's a nexus point where here's a creature, here's alien UFO uh, things that have been seen over their property. It's, it's kind of telling again that in some of these places, it just aligns properly. So yeah, having had that experience as a child, it's always been niggling at the back of my head that I think I had a Bigfoot sighting. Now I also, am honest to the fact that I was 10, 11 years old when it happened. It could have been a homeless man, big homeless guy wearing a tattered jacket. And I misunderstood what I saw, but it was so big and crunching around. My dad and uncle and and grandfather used to go out hunting in part of the back of the woods and you could hear them walking. And it was just a, this was like, when it was walking, it was with force and you know, it it was, it just sounded different and big and loud. So that was really kind of an instigation for me to really be fascinated by Bigfoot. And then the other part to me that I absolutely love is the fact that the Patterson Gimlin Bigfoot film to me is one of the coolest examples of this phenomenon, because as time has progressed and we're, we're able to stabilize the film, clear up the film and scientifically look at it. To me, it only gets better where I would have thought that with the abilities that we've got, it would have degraded the footage and made it look worse or made it so glaringly obvious that it was a costume. And I I think that, and I don't know where you guys stand on this particularly, but that footage to me still holds the test of time 56 years later. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. And then who are your two detractors? And I'll get emails from your fans and listeners. It'll be like, you're a moron and talking out of your ass. You don't know what you're discussing. It was a prank put on by Bob Hieronymus. And uh, I can't remember the name of the costumer off the Philip Morris. And I, I actually had both of those gentlemen on my radio show and I talked to them about it and they, Oh, it was us. And we created the costume. And I said, 
Okay, so in 1967, the Planet of the Apes came out. That was cutting edge technology makeup with millions of dollars put into the work. There was 2001 A Space Odyssey, which opens with these bipedal hairy hominids that look like crappy long-haired gorilla costumes. Really bad. The only other thing that was even close to looking realistic were the monkeys, Mickey, Davy, Peter, and Mike, right? The rest <laughs> right. The, the rest of the costumes and everything looked cartoonish. And and that's I love the Planet of the Apes movies, but it still looked like a costume. So you mean to tell me that in 1967, you created a costume out of an old gorilla costume and and uh, football pads that stands the test of time today that we can actually see muscle structure in the calves, the thighs, and the back as it's walking away. And when they gave you the opportunity to recreate this in the early 2000s, or maybe it was late 90s, they gave them the ability to recreate a costume with the new technology that exists. Their costume looked junkier than something my kids could have put together, and that was a professional costumer. Yeah, what was their response to that? Because I've never spoken to either of those men. Uh, Philip Morris just, uh, well, no, you know, we're, you know I mean, that, that was like at the top of the line costume back in the day and blah, blah. I said, right, but the fact that you could not reproduce it 40 years later with new technology and better costumes because – the the Jack Link's Bigfoot has been around now for what twenty years, and that costume and f- footage is amazing. You couldn't even get close to that with the schlocky costume that you put together and had Hieronymus walking around in. And they, you know, I was very polite throughout the conversation, but I pushed on these points, and they couldn't give me an answer. I felt was real. I felt it was all very disingenuous, and to what end? I don't understand why disavow it unless they felt like they got cut out of something. And as far as I understand, there wasn't a lot of money that was made. And really the only one that really made the money was Patterson on the footage. And I don't even know that that's a a reality. Maybe you guys can answer that element for me. He made some money. Yeah. He, he and Al Diatley made money, but they cut Bob out of it. Um, Bob, uh, uh, never really made anything out of it. In fact, Bob told me he sold all rights to his one third share of the film to Renee DeHinden for $1 because he was so tired of being called a liar and, it, you know, almost broke up his marriage and ruined his life in a lot of ways. Uh, but they, he made enough money that, um, he f- went to Indonesia, um, on a wild goose chase because he received a letter saying that they had a live Sasquatch like creature in a, in an Indonesian monastery. And, um, he spent his money that he earned by taking it on tour and going to places like the Spokane Coliseum and the Portland Coliseum and whatever else. Um, he spent all that money on a trip to Indonesia on a wild goose chase. Wasn't that the, they believed that they had like the top of the skull no, no, that's, you're thinking of the Pengbolche uh, skull in the Pengbolche hand, which is in the Himalayas, a little bit different. They, they said they had a live Sasquatch in a cage. And in fact, a number of years ago, um, a gentleman who at the time was an anthropo- uh, anthropology student um, in uh, eastern uh, Washington, I believe, um, contacted me and said that he was the guy that Roger kind of lined up to pull some shenanigans if they had to, because he was going to go try to buy the Sasquatch from the monks at the monastery. But if things went sideways, he was willing to steal it. And he had an anthropologist on hand to help him with it if, in case it ever went that far, but it never did or anything. So there was no, nothing illegal going on, but apparently they, he sure thought about it. Um, so that seems like an awfully weird thing to do. If you're, if you, you know, put somebody in a suit and filmed it, um, and he died in basically poverty in like what, 72, 73, I think it was 73. I think, yeah, he died, um, thinking that with more money, he could probably cure himself of the Hodgkin's disease that killed him. So yeah, it's unfortunate, but uh, weird behavior for someone if, who, who easily hoaxed such a great and compelling piece of footage. Well, and then the problem, you know, in all of our industries is there's gotta be some PT Barnum Jack Wad out there who's got to do things that that really cast a pall over what we're trying to look at and accomplish. And you know, you know, those are things that have put a, a deep uh, blemish on the fascination for a lot of people. They just expect it all to be hokum and nonsense. 
yeah, it really gives the subject a black eye where people hear about these hoaxes or these uh, twisted tales and they think there's nothing there. There's they, because the cool stuff, the subtle, slow erosion into the truth, you know, into the truth, not not of the truth. You know, this 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 erosion of ignorance as we learn more and more about the animals themselves. Um, that stuff isn't flashy. It's not sexy. And that stuff doesn't get any play on the media, unfortunately, because of it. You know, I even we had we had trouble with our TV show for the same reason. You know, it had to be you know flashy and cool and, and had to hook people because you got to get them around for that commercial break. Um, we I mean I I think Bobo go to attest to this. I've got I got hundreds of emails from people saying you're doing this all wrong. You're banging on trees, making noise. You don't you guys are jackasses. You should go sit in a tree stand and blah blah descent and be quiet. And thinking, well, that's horrible, horrible television. First of all, no one's ever going to watch that. But you know, at, at the same time, like I, I've been pretty successful the last couple of years with this Bigfoot thing, gathering all sorts of interesting evidence and information. But a walk on a road. During the day where one out of five times, one out of eight times you go, you find something cool, that's not sexy. That's just time spent in the woods, and and the media just doesn't care. But they sure like when some jackass dresses up in a monkey suit and waves at a train. Right. But but again, even in those elements, there's something that's a good takeaway. Like I was just like everybody. I kind of bought into that, and I was like, that's cool footage. But what I found even more compelling about it is here you've got something that people could say there's no way a Bigfoot could be there one second and gone the next. From that footage, when that guy crouches down into kind of the fetal position, he just becomes part of the bushes. If you weren't paying attention, you wouldn't have even noticed that there was a guy out there dressed in a gorilla suit. So if that's possible, why couldn't an actual creature that's used to these areas and adaptable have evolved in a way that they could be standing right there and you'd never notice because of the way that they they hide themselves and blend into their surroundings. Yeah, that, that suit is actually commercially available, and it's pretty yellow. It's kind of a golden yellow-brown color. And I, I, I know that that Colorado train footage thing that we're talking about, that's like the, the, the dead grass and stuff that it was, that's kind of this, a similar color. But, you know, but Sasquatches, for the most part, are darker in color, you know, not, not always, but darker in color. They're, they are the color of the woods, just like pretty much every other animal that lives in the woods. It's of, of great interest. And, and certainly, um, they are very, very good at what they do. And most of the time when they are seen, First thing they do is stand completely still. You can wear turquoise in the woods and at 200 yards stand completely still and you're probably not going to be seen. Yeah, I, I, it's that's what I think is so astounding about this. And I've seen some of these beautiful documentaries that have been made showing the adaptability of so many different wildlife species, of how easily they can blend in and how their bodies have learned to fool nature itself, right? There's a snake whose tongue looks like a bug flying around. So when a bird comes down to get it, the snake can get the bird, right? That shows the adaptability and just how brilliant nature is. So if a snake can make itself look like a bug for, you know, something to eat, uh, and, and all of these other animals have got these ways of of just adapting the cuttlefish that becomes translucent, translucent the octopus that can change multiple colors and kind of fade into any kind of obscure background. That's really remarkable. Hey, you know, I know, I know it's a Bigfoot show, but um, I got to ask you, you said you've experienced demons in person. I'm very cautious with using that. I have been in a few instances where I believe that the person I'm dealing with may be possessed or at least dealing with an oppression of something more malevolent because of the abilities and things that are going on around that person. And it has been very frightening. I can't say that, you know, like I go and I see Bobo and and Cliff standing there. I've never had that experience where I just go and there's a demon, but I've been in that situation twice and it has been very disarming nothing like it ever when i've been to you know actual hauntings i think it is so few and far between true demonic possession or demonic realm existing in some of these locations i just think a lot of it is people's perceptions or fear levels like you guys have no problem tromping around in the woods even though there's bear and coyote and and wild cats and mountain lions out there you, you've you're out there protecting yourself, but you're still putting yourself in harm's way. I wouldn't do that. 
right? That to me sounds crazy. I'd, I'm more afraid of being eaten by something that we know exists in my search to find something we're kind of sure exists. So I, to me, that's a different deal, but like with the paranormal, I know ghosts exist. I don't, I can't tell you what they are, but I don't run into the demonic realm that often. That is such a a very limited slice of the pie. And I've talked to people that have been terrified and, and I'll tell your audience, this is one of my favorite stories. This woman reached out to me. She goes, I had this paranormal team come in. They were here 15 minutes and left and they shared the EVP with me and they told me on their way out, we have a demon and that they're not capable of dealing with this. And I said, well, what was the EVP, the electronic voice phenomena recording? And she played it for me and you hear them talking in the background. They're like, yeah, we're going to set up our equipment. And then you hear, which sounds like somebody's stomach making a noise. And that was it. Maybe that was haunted by a frog. Right. <laughs> I said, that was, that was the demonic growl. And she goes, yeah. And I said, well, what brought them to your house? She goes, well, I have this wall with all my collector's plates on it. And right in the middle was my great grandmother's plate. And I was sitting here in the day and it flew off the wall and broke. I said, okay. Did it make like a pentagram pattern on the floor? No. Did it make like a 666 with the broken shards? No. Did the shards jump in the air and try to impale you against the wall? Well, no, that's stupid. And I said, so why do you believe it was a demon? Well, it was my great grandmother's plate. And I said, so do you think today, just go with me on this. Do you think that during roll call in hell today as Lucifer's before his army, he says, all right, you Bobo, go out and start a war in the middle East cliff. I want you to go raise oil prices and Dave go break great grandma's plate. And she laughed. And I said, do you, do you realize the absurdity of that? Do you think that is that like Satan's kind of off nephew and that's the only job he can trust him with? And we talked about it. And I said, just out of curiosity, where did your great grandmother get it? She goes, she got it from her mother-in-law when they got married. And I said, oh, what was their relationship like? Oh, they hated each other. I said, so could it be that great grandma came to visit you and saw that plate up there and knocked it off the wall once and for all to be done with it? And she laughed. She goes, that's exactly what my great grandmother would have been like. <laughs> yeah, I got to ask you, you said, did the pieces come flying at you? Have you talked to people that have had that happen, like stuff break and then fly at them and stuff like that? Yeah, I've had people make some pretty remarkable claims. And I have not seen that myself where things have leapt up and flown. I've seen things move slowly from one room to another, or I've I've been there. And listen, guys, I'm a skeptical believer. I've had experiences my whole life, but I question them constantly. Do you believe any of the people that told you the stories, those stories? like? Yeah, that? yeah. Again, it's hard not to because it's their story and I wasn't there and I don't want to be cruel to them if this is something that happened. But on the Holzer files, I got knocked on my tail two or three times by an unseen force. And had you asked me a day before I filmed that first episode, if I believe that was possible, I would have told you there's no way on God's green earth that's possible. That's that's shtick. That's Hollywood nonsense. And when I got knocked on my ass in, in the Holzer Files first episode at Whaley House, you guys have been around camera guys in the dark, right? They're trying to get around you to get a good shot and they're tripping over logs or whatever. I just assumed that one of the camera guys had come around behind me in this pitch black room and tripped on the carpet and fell into me because it was that heavy. It felt like something hit me like it was falling into me. And when you watch the episode and I turn around, my brain just can't figure out what I'm not seeing. There should have been something there. I got hit hard and I can't wrap my head around it. Now, do I believe it was a demon? No. Do I think it was a pissed off ghost? Yes. Do I understand why it was so pissed off? Yeah, I do believe I know why it was, you know, a a spirit, a, a, a Mexican spirit that had been, um, kind of a hero to his own people. And he was coming back into San Diego with his group to try to take back the land that had been stolen from them. And how were they treated? They were hung or forced to dig their own graves and then stand in front of the grave while they were shot to death. So I think that we uncover the story of this ghost and, and why it's there and give it a voice again and help people have a name to connect to the history. And, and sometimes it it stops, it stops being that way. It could have been, I could have jumped to the conclusion of demon very easily. And I was so lucky to have a great production team that never once asked us to say anything was a demon. 
they would ask, is there any chance that's demonic? And, and then we would debate it on camera. And then when we would calm down and cooler heads would prevail, we'd often, all right, let's not assume it's a demon. Let's assume it's this ghost. And what can we do to help it? What's the next layer of this story? What do we have to do to help out? And so that's, I come at it from a different point. I'm not walking in a place of fear all the time uh, that, that something evil is trying to do me harm. I understand ghosts might just be an unsettled spirit. Uh, if I elect to stay here and watch over my family after I die in spirit form, I'm a, I'm a wise ass as a human. Why wouldn't I be a wise ass as a ghost? If, if somebody's afraid, why wouldn't I poke them? Why wouldn't I moan <laughs> in their ear to freak them out, right? Uh, I think once you get past that, that's when that's when you start to have really interesting experiences. And, and that's what I live for. No, Dave, um, we're, we're kind of coming towards the end of our time here, but um, you have a new book that's out. Um, and and I'm, I'm wondering how much of this stuff is in the book, because the name of the book is Theater of the Mind, Tales from the Darkness, Ghosts, UFOs, Aliens, Monsters, and Other Strange Stories of the Supernatural. Like, where are these stories coming from that you wrote down in this new book of yours? Like, are, are we listening to some of them right now? Or is this like, this is like a, some sort of a autobiographical thing? Or tell us about the book, because it's brand new. It is, uh, it's a brand new book that I just released here in January, the end part of January. And it's stories that people have sent to me through the years and shared with me to share with my audience. And a few of the stories are my own examples. One is a haunted doll that was given to me. And I share the story of why it was given to me, what unnerved the family so much that they demanded to get it out of its house, you know, get it out of their house. And then I had it for a number of years and had some weird experiences, and somebody else wanted it, and they now are the owner of that strange doll. So I just tell the story uh, and how it affected me. There's a story in there about my experience in a haunted hospital when I was there having my gallbladder removed. Um, that story they actually featured on uh, a TV show called Haunted Hospitals. They didn't tell the right story, but uh, you know it's a fun story to watch unfold on TV and then read the real story, uh, which I think is creepier than what they they put out, but, um, and then the rest of the stories are, are stories from people just like you and me that have been in the right place at the right time or had an experience that they can't wrap their head around. Some of the people just want to remain anonymous and do not want their story associated with them because they are military or law enforcement or even moms that just don't want their kids who love the paranormal listening to these shows to hear what their mom saw or dealt with. So I've shared those stories in ways that whoever says I can involve their names, I involve their names. For the people that ask me not to, I keep the names out of it. And uh, I just clear up their punctuation, their grammar, flesh out the story a little bit, but it is exactly as they told me. And that's what we have to offer up for people. And this first book has, uh, I think, 15 or 16 stories in it. Everything from time slip phenomena to doppelgangers, uh, changelings, uh, this creature called the Bloody Bones Man that's terrifying, the black-eyed kids, uh, ghosts, and UFOs and aliens. So it's I didn't want the book to be pigeonholed as a ghost story book. It is a book that tells many different stories from many different walks of life and many different belief systems. And it's just, I, I, these are stories I don't think should just lay in somebody's drawer. So I'm happy to put them out there. And the the people that shared the stories with me all gave me permission. As a matter of fact, it's nice. I go on Amazon and look up my book, Theater of the Mind, Tales from the Darkness. And I've got, you know, over 50 reviews. And a few of those reviews are from the people whose story I represented in the book. And they were so pleased with the way the story came out and me telling their story in a respectful way and keeping their, you know, sanctity <laughs> Didn't that Black Eyed Kids thing kind of come and go? I, I really haven't heard much about that lately. Well, you know, we we pinpoint the first story to Brian Bethel in the late 90s who had an experience with it. And he was a, a reporter who actually went on the record sharing his experience. And then many people started talking about it. Once we pulled that bandage off, other people started relating stories. Now, again, it's a great story that fits into the realm of urban legend. Uh, but unlike urban legend stories, which always happened to a friend of a friend of a friend, and it was passed along, Brian Bethel was the guy, and he tells you his story. I could be wrong. What wasn't that original originally from Portland, Oregon? I can't remember where Brian's from, to be honest with you. 
Yeah, my, my wife got interested in that. My wife's in all sorts of weird things, you know, like paranormal stuff. So she got interested in that and she looked it up and she, and apparently, I, well, if it didn't come from Portland, Oregon, you can actually find out where something like that happened in Portland, Oregon, like the cross streets where that happened. Yeah, and he explains it in his article. So you can look up Brian Bethel and Black Eyed Children and, you know, read his story as he tells it. Um, so I've had people share their stories. And again, they're they're really weird. They kind of fit in that demonic and vampiric legend and lore of they want you to follow them somewhere or they need your permission to enter your car or your home. And they get very angry when you don't allow them in. So it's an interesting element. And I've heard so many different variations of these stories. You know, if you'd like, I'll tell you one that happened here in Minnesota that is one of my favorites. It was, uh, yeah, sure. It's a good way to end the the podcast here. Yeah, absolutely do it. Yeah. And this, this is not in the book. Um, but it's one of the stories I'll probably put in a future book because I love it. We had talked about the black eyed kids. I had this great couple. They were an elderly couple who listened to my radio show. We were on 10 o'clock till midnight every night, Monday through Friday. And she, she contacted me. She goes, you know, after you did that black eyed kid story, I've got to tell you what happened to my husband and I, and this was a few years ago. We had all that rain. Remember, it just was like two weeks of rain, Dave. I'm like, yeah. She goes, well, we were diligent listeners. We would watch the news from nine to 10, turn off the news, go into bed, turn on the radio and fall asleep listening to your radio show. And I'm like, well, that's great. And she goes in this one night, we turn off the TV and we can hear what sounds like kids running around out in our front yard, playing in the puddles and playing in the rain. And uh, my husband went over and he looked through the blinds and he's like, God, what's going on? Where are these screwy kids? And she said, honey, listen, it's been raining nonstop. The parents probably just let the kids run around to burn off some energy. We used to play in the rain. Okay, they go to bed. That's it. About three o'clock in the morning, she wakes up and her husband sleeps with his back to the wall. She's sleeping closer to the door. And she wakes up and there are three children standing inside the room. There's a, a girl in the middle and two boys flanking her. And she can see them from the light that's in the room. They have jet black eyes. She says, I, Dave, I closed my eyes. I took a deep breath because I'm a good listener. I'm a, a good student of the paranormal. And we know that in those moments, that hypnagogic, hypnopompic states of when we're going into sleep or coming out of them, we can have these hallucinatory moments where dreams and reality come together. And maybe I was dreaming about children. And this is just a layer of it. So I closed my eyes. I took a couple of cleansing breaths and I opened my eyes and they were still standing there. And I started to reach to my husband and I opened my mouth to scream and the little girl in the middle stepped forward, pressing her finger to her lips. She said, shh, we just want to look at you. Oh, right. <laughs> she screams, shakes her husband. He gets up. They go through the entire house, turning on every light in the entire house. And that's great husband, right? He gets up with her to go find out what's going on. They cuddled in bed, lights burning in the house until morning time. And that's when they heard the sound of kids laughter outside again. And it just unnerved and freaked them out. But my favorite part of the story, first of all, that was a weird bone chilling tale. But my favorite part was a couple nights later, after we share that story, I go down from our radio station into the parking ramp and there's a cop car parked behind my car. And he goes, are you Dave Schrader? And I'm like, yeah, uh, with darkness radio. I'm like, yeah, he goes, uh, yeah, we got to tell you big fans of the show. All the night crews on EMTs, firefighters, and police love your stuff. We don't believe it. It's insane, but it's fun to listen to. And, uh, you know, you get great stories on there. But the other night you told that story about the three black-eyed kids in that woman's room here in Minnesota. And it was about 1145. You told the story and then went to commercial break. And you go to commercial break and my partner and I start laughing about how absurd and stupid this is. When we get a call over the radio that an elderly woman is calling to complain that there are three children in her front yard at 1145 at night that she doesn't know and they won't leave. And he said, and I looked at my partner and he looked at me and we shook our head and turned the radio off and said, screw that. We're not going. So I love the fact that the cops were so unnerved by the story. They wouldn't even go out to investigate what was happening. That's fantastic. That is just fantastic. And I know you said that story is not in your book, but you also commented briefly saying this first book is blah, blah, blah. And I thought to myself, dude, with a lifetime of experience and listening to people like you have, there could be endless numbers of these books. Um, and, and if you can write half as well as you speak, man, I'm going to read every single one. That's fantastic. 
Well, I've got, uh, I, I, I'm hoping to have the second book out around June or July this year, and then maybe get the third volume out by Halloween. Um, and I'd like to put out these books and, and with the stories that people share. So if your listeners have strange experiences with Bigfoot or Chupacabra or aliens or ghosts or Ouija boards, psychic phenomena, they can email me, Dave at Paranormal60.com. That's Dave at Paranormal60.com. And let me know if I can share your story. We might reach out to you in the future. A, share it on the radio show, the Paranormal 60, or it may be included in an upcoming volume of one of the books that we put out. And again, my job is not to prove or disprove any of these stories. My job as a curator to share the stories that people have had happen. And the reason that I've taken that tack is that there have been some of the stories I've heard that are easy to make you roll your eyes at. And then we've shared them on the air and I've received emails and phone calls from listeners saying, Dave, I want you to know that I've had a very weird life and I had an experience identical to that with the exact same creature. And I thought I was insane. Now that I know I'm not alone, I feel so much better that somebody else has seen what I saw. So I've, I've removed all judgment and just share the stories as they're given to me because I think They're fascinating, interesting looks into the human psyche and belief system. That is fantastic. And this is the kind of stuff that you get on the Paranormal 60 podcast as well. Yeah, um, uh, we, we're live Mondays and Wednesdays on YouTube, so you can watch the Paranormal 60 Live where I'll talk to my guests, and it's a video interview, and then the audio is released Tuesday to all platforms. So I have a little Paranormal 60 podcast kind of network that has five different shows. Monday, if you tune into the audio version, you get New England Legends with Ray Auger and Jeff Belanger. Tuesday, you get the Paranormal 60. Wednesday, Monsters Lounge. Uh, with my friends, Tressa and Jenny Thursday, you get the paranormal 60 news. And then Friday we've got true hauntings, which is a show that comes out of Australia. These two amazing ladies that kind of look at, at paranormal stories, de-evolve them, try to understand them and, and weigh in on if they think that after what they've read and the proof that's been presented, is it a real haunting or not? So we wanted to make a network where it was safe to come no matter what your beliefs or interests are. And there are stories for everybody. And of course, your book is now out. You can get it on Amazon if you want, but there's a better place to get it because I, from what I understand, Dave will sign it for you if you get it from a website. Where is that? Yeah. If you, now for people listening around the world, I can't ship it out. The books are crazy. To send a book to another country, it costs more than the book would have cost to buy it. So you're better off buying it directly from Amazon. But if you're in the United States and would like a signed copy, Just go to paranormal60.com. That's paranormal60.com. And on that front page, just scroll down. You'll see the place where you can order either a signed or an unsigned copy of the book. As soon as I get the order, I sign them and send them out that day. So uh, that's available. And and I hope that your, your listeners will come along on my journey and enjoy what we have to share as well. Well, I'm looking forward to digging into your book for sure. I've, I, I, it's been a delight to speak to you, Dave. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I sincerely appreciate it. And when these other books hit the shelves too, just re, let, let me know. Love to have you back on because you're just a, a, pl- a pleasure to speak to. And guys, let me tell you this from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for the work that you do and for both being so accessible to your fans and to people that have an interest in this field, because that makes the world a little smaller and it makes people feel more like a part of something that we can share these experiences, have these experiences, and know that there are people like you that are entertaining, educational, and informative. So thank you guys for what you do and for doing this amazing show as well. All right. Well, yeah. Thank you too, Dave. It's good talking to you again. We appreciate you coming on. I'll hopefully talk to both of you again real soon. Yeah, hopefully. All right, folks. Well, thanks a lot for Dave Schrader coming out and talking with us today. Hope you all enjoyed it as much as we did. And until next week, you guys know what to do. Keep it squatchy. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Bigfoot and Beyond. If you liked what you heard, please rate and review us on iTunes. Subscribe to Bigfoot and Beyond wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Bigfoot and Beyond Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Bigfoot and Beyond, that's an N in the middle, and tweet us your thoughts and questions with the hashtag Bigfoot and Beyond. 